Good afternoon and welcome to today's teleconference. My name is Eric Pelton. And I'm Mark Donahue. And we're with the firm of Eric M. Pelton and Associates in Falls Church, Virginia. And today we will be speaking about one of my favorite topics, non-traditional trademarks. Let me just remind everybody today that the material presented in here is not formal legal advice and if you have any questions about the issues raised herein or any other trademark issues, you are strongly advised to consult an attorney. Non-traditional trademarks are fun, really is why I enjoy talking about them, and I've spoken and written about them quite a lot recently. Um, as a matter of fact, earlier this month at the American Bar Association's annual intellectual property law conference in Arlington, Virginia, just a few miles down the road from us, I uh, spoke on a panel during the conference, and one of the topics we covered on the panel was uh, non-traditional trademarks. So it's an issue that is a little bit playful. It's also very serious because protecting one's br brand is important and serious. Um, and it's also interesting because it comes up in the news every once in a while. And for example, just last week, uh, this came up in the news uh, related to a lawsuit um, filed about red-soled shoes. And some of you may know what those are and uh, may be familiar with that brand, and we're going to get to that later. Um, but that's a popular celebrity fashion accessory, I'm told. And uh, so it got quite a bit of coverage in the news media last week. Um, Mark, why don't you begin? All right, well, so first it might help to define what non-traditional trademarks are. I mean, when uh, you think of trademarks generally, you think of a logo, you think of the name of a product, or the name, you know, a, a brand of a product. Um, but the trademark law actually allows a much wider range of things to serve as trademarks, be registered and be protected. Now there are some basic uh, requirements for all trademarks, traditional or non-traditional, uh, that always have to be met, um, such as the mark has to be distinctive, it has to identify the source of uh, the product that it's used with, and it has to be used in commerce in the United States in a, you know, in a bona fide way. But once you've done that, just about anything that can distinguish the source of a product and meet those requirements is able to be a trademark and could even be registered at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The statute uh, that provides for trademark protection, the Lanham Act, uh, defines it in very broad terms. Any word, name, symbol, or device, or any combination thereof used by a person to distinguish his or her goods or services can be a trademark. So, we've always had this you know, general sort of, you know, traditional idea of trademarks, but uh, in recent years, non-traditional trademarks have really exploded, and, and the doors opened for that uh, through a 1995 Supreme Court decision about uh, a mundane product, um, pads that go on presses used by dry cleaners to press clothes. And in this case, Qualitex, uh, a company had been selling pads that were green, a particular color of green, uh, and selling them to dry cleaners uh, since the 1950s. And uh, in 1989, a competitor started selling competing pads that were a similar color, and uh, the one who'd been doing it for a long time filed a registration with the Patent and Trademark Office, received the registration, sued for infringement, and won. And uh, the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court on the question of whether or not just a color could be a trademark, because that's all they were claiming. It was like, we're using this color in connection with our pads, and other people can't do that. And the trade and the, the Supreme Court said, sometimes a color will meet ordinary trademark requirements, and when it does so, no special rule prevents color alone from serving as a trademark. And since then, uh, there have been numerous other uh, color trademarks. For example, Owens Corning Insulation is pink. Uh, you know, they use the Pink Panther in their commercials. Um, that is a valid color trademark. Um, Tiffany's Blue, the, the kind of uh, you know, Robin's Egg Blue that they use on their products is also uh, a registered trademark. And these are the colors themselves. You know, used on the type of goods they are, you know, 
know, not in connection with some logo or some other type of packaging, you know, serve to distinguish who it is that provides that product. And, and so that's why they're valid trademarks. And that Supreme Court decision also kind of opened the door for a lot of other kinds of trademarks to, uh, to, to be registered and enforced as well. Yeah, one kind of, uh, or another kind of non-traditional trademark, in addition to colors, is sh is shapes. And shapes, there's a variety of different categories of shapes that are, are registered and protectable. Um, one category is building shapes. The shape of iconic, distinctive buildings can be a registered trademark. Uh, the Chrysler Building, for example, in New York, um, is a registered trademark design. Um, and many other buildings, there was a case in the, in the courts and in the news a few years ago related to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, tried to protect uh, the shape of its building, which is partly shaped like a piano and a guitar, I believe, when you look at it from above, um, being used on merchandise sold near the... Um, Hall of, near that Hall of Fame in Cleveland, and they were successful in uh, arguing that that building design is a protectable and registered trademark. Uh, the shape of Yankee Stadium is also a registered trademark, as are the, sh the, um, the shape of some of the elements of the building in a separate registration, like the actual facade of the upper deck, which is fairly well known and iconic uh, in baseball world, at least. Uh, other stores that that um, we all frequent or drive by all the time also have registered trademark designs for their shapes. For example, the shape of a McDonald's building. Um, you know, McDonald's franchise, virtually all of them uh, are of one shape or, or another. There may be a few different categories. There are actually two or three different registrations for those different building designs. But that McDonald's pitched red roof... Uh, is a registered trademark shape. So if a competing fast food restaurant tried to build a, another uh, building to offer restaurant services with a very similar design, McDonald's would likely be able to stop them. One registration we actually obtained for a client several years ago is for a drive through coffee shop with a cowboy hat sitting atop of it. Hmm. A... Uh, <laughs> I don't recall exactly how they built the cowboy hat, but it's literally a large cowboy hat, three-dimensional, sitting atop as the roof of this drive through coffee uh, window. And that is a registered trademark symbol. So if you're thinking about building a drive through coffee, which I can always use, um, don't build a cowboy hat on it, is the message of that story. But if you're thinking about building <laughs> some other distinctive building, be sure and give us a call. Yes, of course. <laughs> Um, building shapes, one type of shape that are protected. Packaging, package shapes, shapes that things come in, are also uh, often protectable and registrable. One of the more well-known ones we uh, brought here as props, the Coca-Cola shape, I believe in studies done throughout the world, is actually one of, if not the most well-known trademark throughout the world. If you think about how many bottles of Coca-Cola in its um, iconic, distinctive shape have been registered over the decades? It's you know well into the billions, and as a result, around the world, many many people recognize this shape as identifying the brand of Coca-Cola. And, and it's not just the bottle itself; it's just the profile of the bottle. They also use as a mark on the bottle. Um, you know, they use it numerous different ways, even in the recycling uh, logo here. You probably won't be able to see that. Very wisely. In, in, in recent years, they um, very wisely adopted that logo that incorporates the bottle shape and have been using that more and more, I've noticed, even on fountain drinks or on the cups that Coke fountain products come in. Mm -hmm. They use the bottle shape. And now even the two-liter bottles mm -hmm. that you buy in the grocery store come in, come in the same shape. So they've really... Uh, they, they've been very uh, aggressive and uh, 
thinking ahead in protecting this and then using it to even enhance the value of it and the protection for it by using it and featuring it in their advertising and really promoting that distinctive quality and that, uh, of that protectable trademark shape. Uh, some other interesting package designs, if you go into any bar in America and look behind the bar, there are many, many types of liquor bottles that are protective designs like a uh, Crown Royal bottle, like a Absolute Vodka bottle, like a Patron tequila bottle. Um, nearly every popular designer brand of liquor, it seems like these days, has a distinctive packaging. And most of those are protected and registered. Crown Royal is an interesting one. Well, actually, we're going to get to that later in a different section. Um, other great examples of how packaging can serve as a trademark. Um, the shape of a cigarette pack is registered for packaging. Not for packaging cigarettes, for packaging clothing. So somebody came up with, a, with a, what I think is a great idea to, to wrap or box t-shirts that they sell in the store in a box that looks like a cigarette pack. That distinctive packaging is you know, owned by one company. If another company tries to market their, sh their clothing in the same kind of packaging, that's likely going to be an infringement. Similarly, somebody registered the shape of a Chinese food takeout box for a card game. You open up the box and there's a card game that comes in it. Very creative and distinctive, I think. And somebody registered uh, the three-dimensional shape of a tooth for a tooth uh, floss dispenser. Um, also creative and registered by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And uh, in addition to just the packaging um, of a product, you can also register elements of the products themselves. Um, so, for example, uh, the Hershey's Kiss it has got a very distinctive shape, and that is you know, that kind of teardrop shape of chocolate is is registered. And when you see that shape, you immediately think that's a Hershey's Kiss. And and that's kind of the defining feature of a trademark, whether it's a non-traditional mark or a traditional one. Um, likewise, uh, the iPhone, uh, Apple has uh, received a registration for the shape of the iPhone, um, and they've, they've sought to enforce that against other phones that they believe look too much like the iPhone. Um, one that we came across today which uh, interested us was uh, Cinnabon has a trademark for the actual shape of their cinnamon rolls, um, and I, I, it, the way it's described is the way that the that the layers are wrapped around each other, um, and you know we'll probably get around to maybe some of the reasons why some of these marks are arguably there's always debates in non-traditional trademarks about whether or not uh, some of these marks actually serve a source identifying function or maybe whether they get in the way of some of the other uh, requirements that uh, you need to have to be a valid trademark and I think we'll be addressing that later uh, but those are definitely some of the more interesting ones. Another one uh, is this dots candy that is a, a sheet of paper uh, that little dots of candy are laid out on um, it's also a very distinct uh, configuration, and, uh, and so that has also been registered. Um, there's also particular product features, um, not the product themselves, not you know, the entire packaging like the Coke bottle. Um, you know, going back to the, the liquor bottle theme, uh, Maker's Mark has a very distinctive uh, red wax label, uh, or red wax uh, covering that covers the top of the bottle. Uh, and seals it shut, and that's that's a valid trademark. Crown Royal, um, the the distinctive bottle shape comes in a distinctive velvet bag, and so that's uh, you know, a, another mark of theirs. And then, um, as Eric referred to earlier, Christian Lobotin, <coughs> Lobotin I do not Close know enough. how to pronounce it. I'm not familiar with the shoes, but uh, I've met people who do love these shoes. Uh, they have a trademark for the bottoms of the soles of their shoes are colored red. And uh, and that is apparently a pretty distinctive trademark for people who know shoes. They Interestingly though, they have sued uh, another shoemaker who makes shoes that are entirely red. 
And so if you make shoes that are entirely red, obviously the bottom of the, shul, the sole is red as well. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how that case comes out. Also, the, the little red tag that goes on the, next to the, you know, the back pocket of your Levi's, that's also a, uh, a, a trademark of Levi's. Not just what it says on the tag, it says Levi's on there, but the fact that the tag exists there on your jeans, you know, what color it is and where it is, uh, that's a distinctive feature. Eric's got some more examples. Yeah, I've, uh, another example that I just thought of, of a feature that is um, registered as a trademark is when you order a coffee cup at Starbucks, and miraculously we don't have one in front of us right now, um, on the side of the cup when they make a specialty drink, they have the, the boxes and, and a, a little special design there that they use to mark what it is that they're making and whose drink it is. Uh, and that actual display is a registered trademark. Hmm. Now, what they're saying is that if you saw a cup from afar and all you saw was that part of the cup, you would associate that with being exclusively a Starbucks cup or that the customer in general would, that that has become distinctive enough of the Starbucks brand that customers would associate that with Starbucks. Um, whether or not that's true, I'm not sure because clearly it does serve some function and that's one of the underlying things as you mentioned in a lot of these trademarks is sometimes they do serve a function and if they serve a function it might not be entitled to registration at all or it might not be entitled to a strong registration generally except that can be overcome if you're a Starbucks or a, a big company but even a small company based on using it for years, promoting it in the right way to say this is our trademark, this is something that helps identify a brand, getting media recognition and those type of things. Yeah, certainly, I mean, the, the, you always, there's always the danger for a trademark, especially a non-traditional trademark, that a consumer will think it's just an ornamental feature or to think that it's just the color of the product and it doesn't have anything to do with who's providing the product. And so there's, in all non-traditional marks, there's going to be the requirement that you establish either for the USPTO when you're registering it or for a court when you're trying to enforce it, that people recognize it not just as a feature of the product, but as a, you know, as, as something that distinguishes you as, you, you know, you as the provider. But in addition to that, there's this functionality issue and, and no amount of recognition will actually overcome that because, you know, it, and, and this actually was addressed in that Qualtex case we, we talked about earlier, you know, that where a, where a mark is functional, where it's, where it's something that's, if it's essential to the use or purpose of the article, or if it affects the cost or quality of the article, it, that, and that is if exclusive use of the feature would put competitors at a significant non-reputation related disadvantage, it cannot serve as a mark. And, and this is where things like the shape of a Cinnabon, you know, are a little bit, you know, mystifying. Because on the one hand, it's like, would you know that that's a trademark when you see it? And on the one hand, and then also, is it cheaper for them to make it that way? And that's why they make it that way? Does it taste better? Because there's more cinnamon in it? You know, but, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. Right. So we talked a lot about... Um a lot about shapes. I'm now going to talk about another sort of type of non-traditional trademark, which is patterns. Um, some well-known patterns that are protected and registered are the Burberry um, pattern that they originated on the inside lining of raincoats, I believe, but now has expanded to all types of accessories and luggage and scarves and hats and the outside the entire of jackets. exterior right. of raincoats. Yeah. Um, but they have protectable rights in that pattern. Louis Vuitton uh, has aggressively sought to enforce um, its pattern of uh, the LV in sort of interlocking or overlapping and then repeating in a distinctive pattern or in a pattern. I'm not sure how this thing is, but um, on its products. Uh, another interesting pattern that's registered is the Yankee pinstripes. New York Yankees pinstripe uniforms uh, is registered, and I, I don't think you see any other professional sports teams 
using pinstripes. If you did, I would imagine that they're at least going to be different in the color or the width or the spacing um, of the stripes. Another category of non-traditional trademarks is smell or fragrance. <coughs> now again, keeping in mind functionality, smell or fragrance can only serve to recognize the brand as a trademark when the smell is not critical to the function of the product. So we're not talking about perfumes and colognes and other things that naturally carry an odor. We're talking about things like office supplies, um, lubricant for cars, uh, and things like this where the manufacturers have applied a scent for no other purpose, you know, other than some pleasant scent and to say, when you smell this scent in connection with this product, you now know where it comes from. Um, you know, so I don't think a cherry scent for soda couldn't be registered because that would be coming from a cherry flavor which would have a taste function, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm imagining. But a peppermint scent for office supplies, for folders and for paper, literally is registered. There's some company that makes office supplies that have this hint of peppermint, and I have yet to encounter them in person. Um, but if you smell those, apparently it can only represent one source. <laughs> um, yet another category, uh, a growing category of non-traditional trademarks is touch or feel. And the, the two types of trademarks that have come across that have this uh, texture or touch element to it are some marks that are in Braille. Um, Stevie Wonder owns a bunch of registrations for his clothing line and for his entertainment services that um, are just braille, you know, three-dimensional impressions of the spelling of Stevie Wonder in braille. Um, and there is a wine company that makes a wine bottle that has a, a wrap or a label around it that is a uh, leather texture and that texture of having leather as a uh, feature of the wine bottle packaging is a registered trademark at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And another more common category, uh, you know, includes sound. Um, you've almost certainly encountered the MBC chimes uh, between shows or during commercial breaks. Those are registered trademarks. There's also the da -da 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 that you get from Intel uh, commercials. Um, you know, and along with their Intel and Sidemark. And then there's also the lion's roar at the start of MGM movies um, is also a registered trademark. Um, one area that is uh, perhaps only speculative at this point, but you know, based on the decisions isn't ruled out, is uh, flavor. Um, we don't know of any current uh, valid trademark registrations for flavor marks uh, right now, um, but as long as it isn't functional, kind of like, uh, you know, from the scent side, you know, it would be hard, I think, to register um, a flavor for chewing gum or something like that that relies on flavor for its function. But if it goes for something else, then, you know, perhaps, you know, just to identify who you're getting the product from, it, it's hard to imagine what circumstance that would be practical. Uh, it, it could be valid. So the one application we know of, and this was ultimately refused, was an orange flavor for um, a pharmaceutical pill uh, that was taken uh, orally. And, uh, and I believe it was refused uh, because the, the, they found that the taste made the pill easier to take. So um, that's kind of you know, running into practical limitations there. So we've covered on colors, um, shapes of products, shapes of buildings, uh, scent, sound, touch, flavor. Um, those are the uh, most common or categories of non-traditional trademarks. The traditional non-traditional. The traditional non-traditional. Um, and uh, we've created one other category that's just sort of a hodgepodge of everything else. And um, these include moving images. You can have a logo or a graphic that um, changes or is a sequence of, of images that creates one whole pattern or one whole 
um, image that could be registered and protected. It could even be potentially a short video clip um, or a hologram that could be a registered trademark identifying a brand. Uh, sports uniforms. Many professional sports teams have the um, jersey designs in terms of the placement of the colors and the stripes and things like that uh, as registered trademarks. And they also have, some of them have the helmet designs like in, in football um, as registered trademarks. Also in the sports theme um, is mascots. A lot of teams and even corporations now have registered mascots. The costume, the three-dimensional appearance of the costumed character is a registered trademark. For example, the Red Sox have this Wally the Green Monster uh, mascot. There's a tax company, I think it's Liberty Tax Services. It must be Liberty Tax Services because it's a woman standing on the corner dressed as the Statue of Liberty waving you in to come find out more about their tax services and her that Statue of Liberty costume doesn't have to be a woman, I suppose. It doesn't have to be on the corner either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to illustrate. Right. Um, that Statue of Liberty costume is registered for providing tax services. Uh, you can still dress as the Statue of Liberty for Halloween, as, as many of us do every year. <laughs> um, other uniforms, that's kind of a uniform mascot costume intersection is uh, postal carriers, the postal, uh, the mailmen of the U.S. and male women of the U.S. Postal Service, their uniform has been a registered trademark for a long, long time, actually. Uh, and also back on the sports theme, the blue turf of Boise State. Every time I flip past a late night uh, Boise State game on ESPN, you immediately know it's at Boise State when you see this very stark, bright blue turf field. That blue field is a registered trademark. The Smurf turf. And then we, we finally get to two of my favorite um, trademarks out of all the trademarks, uh, particularly non-traditional trademarks, uh, which really are cannot be categorized as anything else except for just odd. Uh, one is the Marching Ducks of the Peabody Hotel. And I'll read you the description of their trademark registration. The live visual and motion elements of the Peabody Duck March. The motion elements include the red carpet being rolled out, the appearance of the ducks and uniform duck master at the elevator door, and the march of the ducks down the red carpet, up the steps, and into the fountain where they begin swimming. So, if you're ever at a hotel and you see ducks coming down the elevator and marching through the lobby on a red carpet being rolled out, and going swimming in the fountain, it could only mean you're staying at a Peabody Hotel. A similarly odd trademark is goats on a grass roof. This is registered for restaurant services to some restaurant in the Midwest um, that literally has a rooftop made of grass with goats grazing on top of it. And this is a attraction, as you might imagine, um, and perhaps a selling point for the restaurant. And they have registered this, and the most surprising thing I find is not just that they've registered it, but that they have had to enforce it against some other restaurant at least one time that tried to copy the theme of having goats grazing atop its roof. Um, so now that we've sort of given you some of these fun trademarks and a whole list of the types of... Um, non-traditional trademarks, we want to just briefly uh, address some more about the issues that come up when you're trying to register them and protect them. I will start with the registration issues. We mentioned a lot, functionality is a big issue. Another big issue is identifying a particular service. Um, you know, you can have goats on your roof if you're operating a computer store or you're operating a law firm, apparently. Goats on a roof are protected for restaurant services. Every trademark, whether it's traditional or non-traditional, must be tied to the actual offering or sale of products or services. So defining what those services are, defining what the trademark is, whether it's a color, whether it's a shape and how you're going to represent and draw that shape, or if it's a product configuration, or it's only part of a product configuration, how you're going to delineate which part of it you're claiming serves as a trademark and which part of it 
you're ignoring in the application because it's functional or because it doesn't represent a particular brand. These are some of the very tricky aspects of trying to register and protect a non-traditional trademark. Um, many of these non-traditional trademarks end up on the supplemental re register because of some of these reasons, because um, they might be ornamental or because they might be uh, descriptive or might not have acquired distinctiveness. Um, that's okay. You know, supplemental register is better than not having a trademark registration at all, generally. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if, you know, if you are able to obtain a trademark registration and is on the supplemental register, it may be possible to come back a few years later after you've sold more, advertised more, maybe incorporated promoting whatever this non-traditional element of your branding is into your marketing, coming back later and claiming that it has acquired distinctiveness and might be capable of being registered on the principal register. So. Mark's going to pick up on these issues and talk about enforcement. Yeah, enforcement of non-traditional marks can also be a little bit more difficult uh, because, you know, if it's not a word, if it's not a picture, um, you might have trouble defining exactly to a court, you know, what exactly uh, your trademark is and how close another trademark is. For example, if your trademark is a smell, say it's a peppermint smell, if someone else has some other kind of peppermint smell, How's the court supposed to decide how close together the peppermint smells are? Are they so close that they would be confused? Is uh, a different kind of mint smell far enough away that someone wouldn't think it's your peppermint smell? Um, those are issues that haven't been hashed out a lot because there haven't been a lot of cases about this. Um, other problems are you know, searching for infringers. Um, you can't just go online and search for a smell or search for a color, um, you know, try, you know, trying to find people who are playing off your mark can be a little more difficult when it's not so uh, easily uh, categorized like uh, traditional trademarks are. Um, and so, you know, that's where, you know, you know, and then finally there's, there is this issue that you will always have to demonstrate that you, there's there's not a presumption for a lot of these non-traditional marks that that the trademark you know serves as a mark. You're going to have to make that demonstration if you end up in court enforcing your mark. You're going to have to show how much you've used it and that people recognize it as yours. Uh, the other side is going to come after you you know certainly and claim that it's functional or <coughs> claim that it's ornamental and and try and poke holes in your in your mark. And so you know it's often difficult to enforce, you know, the people who, the companies that have marks that are, you know, that they can obviously show they've been using for a long time and have been making lots of sales under, uh, you know, have an easier time doing this, um, but it, it doesn't mean it's not a protection worth So one tip it. would be, um, you know, if you think you might have a non-traditional trademark, mm -hmm. to document it well, right, 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 to collect as much evidence you can about it, about how it was created, about how it was launched, about how you market it, about consumers' impressions about about it, about it showing up in media coverage, you know, unsolicited media coverage, um, and even, you know, you may want to feature it in some way in your marketing to help draw out the fact that this is something that you claim is a trademark and is distinctive um, to represent your brand. So I think that that's one of the, one of the um, takeaways from from today's call would be that if you think you might have a non-traditional trademark, it's, you know, figure out how can you isolate that and enhance it and, and build a case that makes it, you know, that that will add to your protection for it. Yeah, um, you, yeah you can't go back and start keeping records retroactively. You know, so you can, you've got to start, uh, you know, all of this intellectual property protection really comes down to planning ahead. And, and heading off the conflicts and securing your rights before someone else tries to bring them in doubt and, you know, keeping track of the evidence before you actually need it. And I'll give you an example, you know, a non-traditional trademark does not have to involve goods that cost $900 or that are worn in, by celebrities, but the, the Louboutin shoes that were, you know, recently part of this complaint against Yves Saint Laurent, um, in the complaint, they detail 
photographs of celebrities wearing these shoes. They list out the celebrities that wore them at the Grammys and the Oscar Awards. They list out the department stores that carry the shoes. Um, they list out how they have a special page on their website about trademark protection for the red soles. And um, so these kind of steps, again, it doesn't have to be on that kind of celebrity or financial scale. Um, anybody can do that, especially with the internet now. It's, it's so much easier and cheaper to, um, you know, to create this kind of media and to preserve these kind of things. Um, those kind of things, if you're going to try to register and enforce a non-traditional trademark, uh, will make it a lot, lot stronger and easier. Um, so to conclude, you know, Mark read from the statute at the beginning, which is a great way to come back. And it's basically, you know, trademarks are not just brand names and logos and slogans. They're anything that distinguishes one company from its competitors. That could be a, a jingle. It could be a sound. It could be a color. It could be a shape. Um, you know, it, it could be any. It could be a costume, a mascot. It could be something else that nobody's even thought of yet, or that some that people have thought of, but we just didn't cover today. Because it can take on any form or shape, really, potentially. So find what makes your product distinctive, and follow that. Make it a trademark. Exactly. If there's something distinctive about what your company does, you know, what can you do to 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 leverage that? You know, it's enhancing the marketing for that and the reputation for that and protecting it and making it known that it's yours and that it's protected so that you can keep other people from doing it which will make the value of your doing it even greater um you want to you want to yeah so yeah just in conclusion that here we need to remind everyone again this is not intended to be specific legal advice uh for any particular uh, problem or case you might have uh, we're just giving general guidance about, you know, the trademark law. If you do have, uh, you know, a particular question or a particular issue, we strongly advise seeking out a trademark attorney yourself and, uh, and getting advice particular to your situation, because all situations are different. And you can find us online at ericpelton.com, which is E-R-I-K-P-E-L-T-O-N.com, or just search your favorite browser, uh, your favorite search engine for Eric Pelton, and you'll see Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, any of the variety of ways to stay in touch with us. Uh, this presentation has been copyright 2011, Eric M. Pelton and Associates, PLLC.